All right. Let's continue our conversation on Stoicism, going over the moral letters by Lucius Aeneas Seneca. And we have landed on letter 80, which I think has a couple of interesting points to it. The first one is the start of the letter. From Seneca to Lucilius, greetings. Today I am at leisure. Not so much thanks to myself as to the games which have called away all the bothersome people to watch the boxing. No one will burst in or will interrupt my train of thought which goes forward more boldly in that it has this assurance. The door has ceased its constant creaking, my curtain will not be drawn aside, I have license to proceed in safety, as a person needs to do when he is striking out on his own and making a path for himself. Am I not following earlier thinkers, then? I am, but I also allow myself to discover new points, to change things, to abandon older views. I can agree with them without becoming subservient. This first part, I think, is a vital part. I think it is crucial when you talk of an ancient Hellenistic philosophy to position things in the context in which they were written. So, for example, uh, later in this letter, Seneca talks about slavery. Uh, which in Roman times was very, very common, very normal, and which these days we would say is not normal, right? Is not acceptable. So that's not, I mean, slavery is not a, a vital component of, of Stoicism, but to the Roman Stoics, it was. Epictetus himself used to be a slave. So that's what I mean by putting that in the historical context in which those texts were written. Now, I think more importantly, it's crucial to think about what still makes sense in our world and what no longer makes sense. And if you stick blindly to all Stoic principles, many of which I think make a lot of sense, but some of which are, are clearly outdated, are, are no longer something that makes sense, well, then I don't know how much service you're rendering yourself or others and how helpful it is for you to stick to Stoicism. And a clear example for me has always been uh, from Epictetus, and I'm pretty sure it comes from the Enchiridion, but if it's not that, then it's the Discourses, which I was thinking maybe the Discourses would be a good continuation once we're done with Seneca. Anyway, Epictetus describes someone in an abusive relationship, and the question was put to him, what, what can you do? And his answer is nothing. You have to endure it, because what else can you do? Well, that is a type of thinking that I would say is no longer of this world and no longer makes sense. You do have an opportunity to leave an abusive relationship, and I'm not saying that that would be easy. I, that's often exaggerated. Oh, just walk away. I know it's not that easy, but having said that, the thought of, I'm in an abusive relationship, I should stay in it because there's nothing I can do, is an irrational thought, and not a thought that is helpful in any way, shape, or form. So that is, in my mind, a, uh, a compelling example of where Stoicism is very hardcore about you just accept your fate. And I think that we have evolved enough uh, since those words were written, to now say, yeah, no, that's not really how it works. You you can accept your fate in some degrees. For example, if, if you become ill and there is no cure for whatever it is you have, then there is little else to do but accept that you have fallen ill and that there is no cure. But that, to me, is a little different than, oh, just stay in an abusive relationship. So what I'm trying to say is... What Seneca here says, am I not following earlier thinkers then? I am, but I also allow myself to discover new points, to change things, to abandon older views. I can agree with them without becoming subservient. I think that's, that's a very important point. 
And like I said, to me, many things, many aspects of Stoicism still make a lot of sense and are still very applicable today. Like uh, um, uh, some things are within our control, some things are not within our control, like uh, preferred and dispreferred indifference. I still think these are very powerful aspects of Stoic ethics. Other things don't make sense anymore. Many of us would not believe that Zeus created heaven and earth, for example. Right? Um, anyway, so some things are worth updating. Now he continues. Most of all, I ponder this. If the body can, with training, come to such a peak of endurance that it is able to sustain punches and kicks from more than one opponent, to bear the hottest glare of the sun, the most scorching heat of the dust, and to do this for an entire day while drenched with its own blood, then surely the mind can be strengthened far more easily to accept the blows of fortune, to be knocked down and trampled and yet get up again. For the body needs many things in order to thrive, but the mind grows by itself, feeds itself, trains itself. Athletes require a great deal of food and drink, much oil and lengthy exercises, but virtue will be yours without any supplies or expenses. Anything that can make you a good person is already in your possession. That, I think, is a very powerful way to look at it. And an important reminder, change does not happen on its own. Change has to be wrought. You have to actually make effort to make change. Uh, and that's very applicable to Stoicism. If you want to practice that, if you want to incorporate Stoic thought into your everyday decisions, your everyday life, you can. And I think in many ways, it's, it's not for everyone, but in many ways you may find that it helps your everyday life. I'm assuming that if you're still watching these videos you found some value to Stoicism. But it requires practice. Time and again, remembering yourself. Some things are, some things are not within my control. There are preferred and dispreferred indifference. If I'm feeling something, is it worth feeling this thing or not? If it is not, I need to revoke that feeling, otherwise I'm going to feel bad later on. All of these are important things that you have to keep reminding yourself of. And it's very easy to do that when everything in your life is going well. It's much harder to do that when things in your life are not going well, but that is when you need those teachings the most. You can train the mind, you can reprogram to a degree the mind, but it is continuous work. Not work in ways of only quoting Stoicism when things are well in your life. And the final thing that I think is very interesting in this letter uh, is he gives some advice. He says, free yourself first from the fear of death the fear that is the yoke about our necks, and then from the fear of poverty. If you want to know how little harm there is in poverty, compare the faces of the poor with those of the wealthy. The poor person laughs often and from the heart. None of his worries go deep, even if some care befalls him, it passes by like a wisp of cloud. But in those who are called well off, we see a feigned cheerfulness under which runs a deep vein of gangrenous sorrow made even deeper because, as a rule, they cannot be miserable in the sight of others, but with pain gnawing at their very hearts, must still act the part of happiness and success. I mean, Seneca was a millionaire. So it's fairly easy to say, don't be troubled by poverty, when you certainly have no financial worries whatsoever. But having said that, I think his point in itself is an interesting one. Money is preferred and different. All else being equal, we would rather have than not have money. But at the end of the day, even without money, we can choose to act in a certain way that is virtuous, that helps us progress to where we want to be, uh, that is in line with, call it the, the way of the universe, the universal way, nature, any of these stoic terms work. Uh, fate, maybe, if you prefer that. But don't let the wrong things distract you. And we've talked many times, given his letters, about the fear of death and death, so I don't think we have to reiterate all that. Uh, pov poverty is another thing. It's a concern for many people, and understandably so. It's just a thing to think about. And by thinking about, as we've said before, the worst thing that can happen, typically... What actually ends up happening is not the worst thing, it may not be the best thing, but it's typically not the worst thing, and as a result, things work out okay. People feel fairly okay. 
So, there we have it. I hope this was useful. Let me know what you think of this letter. And um, in this book, which uh, separates the, uh, the letters uh, into separate books, I don't know if those are old scrolls. This is the only book I have that actually uh, um, separates the letters into separate books. Uh, and I want to say there are 12 books or so, and we have... Oh, no, wait a minute, book 17? No, okay, I was just going to say, we've just entered book 10, but that's no. Never mind. I'll gladly see you later.